I'm Sam West from Cheshire, motorbike racer. I just turned 36 during the last TT. Time flies. I've been racing British Superbikes, Superstock 1000 and the road racing for about what, 15 years now. And um, I'd like to say I'm in the meat of my career. My granddad was a biker, my dad was a biker. I was never allowed to have a bike growing up or get involved in racing or anything like that. We didn't have any racing in the family. Uh, my granddad was a mechanic and always had motorbikes and then my dad had bikes as well but my mum was quite against it and obviously didn't want us to be involved so I didn't get a bike until I was 18 and then obviously I sort of decided I can do whatever I want so I bought a cheap uh, rotter off eBay and that was it, got started so a lot later than a lot of people and then I got in trouble of course as you do you know, young lad with a motorbike got a, a ban or two and decided that I have to go and do a track day did one track day and absolutely loved it and decided to go racing, that was it and I was 20 years old so that's it and it's been just a non-stop 15, 16 years since then And in terms of what's involved I mean a track day is one thing but when you decide that you want to go racing as we keep hearing it's not just as simple as saying all oh, right I'm just I'm going to turn up and do it finance support mm. what's that journey been like for you yeah it's been a tricky one I suppose you don't just decide to go racing do you after doing a track day the thing was I was already racing push bikes and I already had done all the way through my, my teenage years so I'd done stuff I was already doing time trials and hill climbs uh, mountain biking I'd won a downhill championship so I was doing every type of push bikes you could possibly get and I was still doing it at the time and uh, once I'd done that track day I was like that's it no more push bikes right? I'm going to race motorbikes so I already had the racing mentality I was already used to the idea of a calendar and schedule and training so for me it was then just about trying to work that towards a motorbike instead so I went with my dad and we bought um, a, a bike from a scrapyard 1500 quid it was and uh, to go novice racing old Ducati and I won my first championship I won pretty much everything in the year we got a litre bike towards the end of the year got podiums on that and then in my second full year of racing I went straight to British Superbikes into Stock 1000 which that's was a, so quick yeah no it was a huge jump and the thing was I was idolising these guys I was riding with because I was a road biker you know and I followed the TT and racing and I used to read MCN you know when we had newspapers back in those days <laughs> I used to read that every weekend and you know, suddenly in my first year, well, actually, within 18 months of doing my first track day, I was doing a support race at Mozo GP in Superstock 1000. And I'm looking around at the guys, you know, that I'm on track with. And, you know, these are guys like McGuinness and Plato and stuff. I'm looking around, I'm, like, I'm on track with these guys. This is unbelievable. And obviously, I was slow. I was at the back. But, you know, I was out there. I was doing it. And I was qualifying and qualifying lap times. I got faster and faster in Superstock until I was scoring points did three, four years of that and then eventually I was quick enough and stopped making silly mistakes really and I could go road racing which was what the goal always was get to the TT and as you said at the beginning you weren't really allowed bikes when you were growing up what were the conversations like in your household when once you made that decision I mean you were over 18 you were able to do what you wanted but how tricky was it broaching that subject? I think uh, my dad had always said he wouldn't buy us a motorbike, he wouldn't get us into it, but we'd, he'd buy us our second motorbike sort of thing. So, you know, once I'd proven I'd got a bike and fixed it, I bought all the kit and done my test and insured it, and I'd done all that myself, then my dad was quite keen to step in and, you know, help me do it in a safe and sensible way rather than a reckless teenager way. My mum was still quite against it. Um, she was a very competitive person, and my her dad was a professional footballer, and she was a competitive swimmer, so the competitive side is from her so while she didn't like the motorbike thing she was very supportive of the competition so he was supportive of the bike she was supportive of the competition and it worked quite well I think and you know at that age when you're 20 you need some direction don't you it's very useful to have your parents helping you in that way they did a lot for me in my first years of racing definitely and and help me get where I am. Would you describe yourself as a competitive person? Unfortunately, absolutely, yes. <laughs> Everything's competition, whether it's with someone else or just competing with myself. Yeah, very um, performance-oriented and, you know, everything I'm always driven to better myself. It's hard, that, though, isn't it, sometimes? Because you must set the standards for yourself really high. Yeah, I suppose everyone does in this game, don't you? you certainly got an idea of what you want to achieve and you put more pressure on yourself than anyone else ever would do, you know? As you said, the goal was always to to come and race over here on the Isle of Man. What path did that take? How did you get here? Yeah, I think the goal was that. I remember as a little kid, some of my early childhood memories being sort of glued to my granddad's TV, watching these old videos, TT videos and black and white stuff, and it was just mind-boggling, you know, the whole idea of it. And then growing up, and I remember watching the, like, Superbike races, BSB-style stuff on Sundays and thinking how cool that is. It was always where I wanted to be, and the road racing certainly was just something that inspired me. 
and being a road rider as well, I learned to ride in the Peak District, so I really felt like I could gel with that a lot more than the circuits. You know, the the guys on the circuits, uh, when they start racing as kids, they used to just crashing and crashing and crashing. <laughs> Certainly from coming as a road rider, I wanted to come at it from a different perspective and try and not crash so much, go as fast as I can without crashing. And I think that works well for, for road racing. Was it easy enough sort of getting the, the support in terms of sponsorship and the, and the financial side of things sorted? No, it's never easy. And unfortunately, I think that's the most difficult thing. While I rushed through and got into BSB really quickly, I was naive because I didn't come from a racing family. We made loads of mistakes. We didn't have any money. We did the wrong things. It was difficult. And it's difficult without the networking of coming from a racing background to get that sponsorship. So I've been very lucky in getting the sponsors that I have done, you know, and I could never have done it without them. But I think that's been the biggest challenge for me is learning that whole sector because riding a bike, you can learn that and it can come quite natural. Competition can be quite natural. But going out there and actually trying to tout yourself and get people to pay for the sport that you love doing, that's much more difficult. And also you have to balance this with real life, with presumably having a a job as well, but going away enough to get signatures that you need, etc. I mean, how's that work-life balance been? Uh, testing, <laughs> it's definitely difficult. Um, I've got a motorbike workshop in Stoke-on-Trent that I run with my friend, uh, motorhub.co.uk. Go, plug there, go and have a look at us. I do all the ECU and dyno work. We've got a big workshop. It's um, it's like my dream workshop now. I've risen up to a level in racing and I've risen up to a level in work as well. And we do now have a really good workshop, fantastic sales departments, really nice dyno room with, with top spec stuff. So the workshop is fantastic. But like you say, balancing that with coming racing is difficult and I don't know how anyone would do it with a proper job because it's easy enough for me to make up the time because I'll just work every hour every day all through winter I'll just work you know seven days a week and you work every hour you can to make up for your two weeks off for TT your week off for northwest your week off for southern and then you know there's so much time off all the way through summer but I can make it up. It's not a problem. I don't know how the lads with the real jobs could ever manage it. Love the fact you describe it's not a real job. Love no, no. <laughs> it's never a real job if you like what you're doing. I absolutely love being in the workshop. And if I wasn't racing, the workshop is where I want to be, working on motorbikes as well. That's that's me through and through. I, I love what I do. So in those first early years when you were going around racing everywhere, what are the standout moments? Oh, wow. It, you know, winning the championship in the, the first year, I never expected anything like that because I'd, I'd had some decent results on the push bikes at a club level, you know, only novice stuff, really. So to go and win a novice championship and go straight onto a big bike, it all just felt so natural, you know, it all just came. I had Every time someone gave me a faster bike, I just went faster and just got better and better results. And standout things, yeah, doing a support race at MotoGP, you know, within, like I say, 18 odd months of doing my first track day, that was pretty amazing. That was good. Scoring my first points at BSB, stock thousand was a you know a really nice result as well but i think for me the standout results haven't been short circuits the things i really hold on to have been the road race results you know i've had some fantastic times in road racing and it's really given back to me a lot more than the short circuit ever has I guess when you're doing that and you're talking about these names that you recognised and and you sort of grew up watching and then you're among them and they're starting to notice you, what's that like? It's really good. It's always been strange, you know, people like, you know, John McGuinness, I idolised him. You know, I'll chat to John now and he's just a normal bloke, as, as everyone is. But for the first few years, I was just, I didn't want to be close to him on track. I was so nervous about, you know, bumping into him and knocking him off. And it's the same with all those guys. Um, But yeah, when you start to get results, you know, and I'd finished sixth at the Ulster and sixth at the Northwest, and you're starting to really nip the heels of these guys and thinking, I can really do this. And, you know, they're not necessarily all that special. They're just the same as the rest of us. And on my day, I'm certainly as competitive as them. It feels good to suddenly achieve those levels. And I know I've had a few difficult years and I'm not quite in that top six point now, but, you know, I have run in those those top six positions at the Northwest and the TT, at the Ulster. And TT, I nearly had a good result and the crank failed, you know, on the BMW. But that's part of racing, isn't it? And so 2014 was your first MGP over here. What do you remember about that time? I remember everything. It was, it was fantastic. It was everything I thought it would be and more. Because I'd, I'd wanted to do the TT and I was doing BSB, I felt there was a lot of pressure on the TT and a lot of people were watching. If you went from Superstock BSB to go and do the TT, it certainly felt in that paddock like everyone was watching. And it's such a competitive paddock, the Superstock 1000. Everyone knows each other. So if one person goes and does the TT, everyone else is saying, well, how's Sam going to do? We'll watch that. Will we judge? And maybe we'll go and do it next year. Because there's this ridiculous idea in the BSB paddock that road racers get paid loads of money to do it, which is not the case at all. There is more support, you know, we're lucky we get more support in road racing than you do on short circuits, definitely. But 
everyone is looking to see is this the way your career can go and I didn't want to be a benchmark and I didn't want people to look at how I was doing so actually I thought well if I do the Manx instead of the TT I can do it under the radar I can do it on my own terms and see if I do love road racing because at that point I'd stopped road riding and was just focusing on the racing and I wanted to just go with my motorbike and my little crew of people and just ride the event you know I didn't want to do this big TT thing I just wanted to do the circuit and road racing and see if I loved it yeah it was just mind blowing everything I thought it was going to be and more what would you say was the most unexpected thing from it I think how natural it felt you know I didn't expect that I did so much time we did time in the car the Obviously, the Manx and the TT are great at getting newcomers over. I did 52 laps in a car, all the bus laps. And, you know, I did everything possibly could. But then when I got there, actually, it was just, just riding my bike. It was completely normal and natural. And I was very lucky in that we got to do some wet laps as well, which they don't do. And, you know, obviously, we don't do wet laps now. So I got to experience that, and I'll always hold on to that, you know, coming up the mountain in the fog and the rain. And that was just an incredible... The hairs are standing up, you know, on my arms now thinking about it. It's just an incredible experience to look back and do that. And every night just going faster and faster and not having any scares. And it just came so naturally, you know. It was literally just riding my bike. And had you set yourself a sort of benchmark of what you wanted to achieve that first time? It's difficult to set a benchmark. Obviously, you go, well, the first thing is, you know, you want to do a 100-mile-an-hour lap, but you do that almost immediately because your newcomers lap to 90-odd-mile-an-hour. And then you go, well, I want to do 110. And... The, the benchmarks always move and the goals always change and they still do now you know you go to the TT all right 130 is the benchmark and I've only done 129.7 but that 0.3 seems impossible to get so you know you have to look at different benchmarks the whole point but certainly at the Manx I just wanted to experience it and see it and just go faster every time and that's exactly what I did and I completely fell in love with the island and everything everything about being here and so the next year then you did do the TT did you have much of a decision to make about that? I'm imagining you probably didn't, actually. You know what? It's funny because I went straight from the Manx to the TT and I'd never ridden a 600 before in my life because I moved through so quickly because I'd done the Ducati thing. So when I went to the Manx, we had to buy a 600 so we could do the Manx. So I really had no experience of that motorbike. And then I went to the TT and suddenly I did five races. So it was complete opposite end of the scale. But yeah, I did that from one year at the Manx to suddenly doing the TT and the big drive really for me to the TT was to use my big bike because I'd been riding the super stock bike at BSB all the time that's the bike that felt natural to me and at the Manx you know this was a new 600 to me and I had to learn that so I wanted to ride the bike that was natural to me allowed me to progress and really that's what drove me to do the TT rather than the Manx again was because I was I was riding a litre bike all the time and that's what I needed to ride. And was there much difference for you between those two events? Was it, you know, much of a leap from MGP to TT? Oh, yeah, it was night and day. It was so different. I know now things are a little bit different in the way the Manx is run and everything, but certainly then it felt incredibly different going for the, the Manx to the TT. It certainly was. And, you know, just in terms of laps, the number of laps. So the TT, you can do six laps a night. I think in my first Manx, I only did something like 12 laps in total because there was poor weather and cancellations and shortens and delays, things like that. And suddenly you go to the TT and in the first two nights you've done as many laps as your whole Manx in one go. And then you can do four laps, six laps. There's just so many laps at the TT. The practice time is so well managed and structured that you get so much track time. And how does that affect you physically? Physically, I've never really struggled because of, I've always been keen on my fitness and racing push bikes and I'm a complete gym addict. Um, so physical fitness wise, I don't really struggle. and never really have, to be honest, at the TT. Yeah, certainly it takes a, a lot of physical fitness, but I think a lot of the guys were above the minimum requirements as such, you know, to ride the TT on a big bike. You do have to be fit, but we all really put the effort in. But what about mental fitness as well? Because, uh, you know, I was thinking about that nowadays. People have generally got really short attention spans. We're sitting there, we're scrolling through our phones, you know, we, we don't even wait for the intro of a film anymore. Yet when you are doing a lap of the TT course, or you're doing six a night, that is a hell of a lot of mental capacity that you need to find. How do you find that side of it? That's a bit of a tricky question, I suppose. It's just how the brain works, isn't it? And the way you, your brain processing works, I think it's much easier in a way to ride the faster mic definitely i really struggle on the super twin i only raced one of those around the tt i was thinking oh, i wonder what we're going to have for dinner later what are we going to do tomorrow we can go down to the beach we can have a swim or something in the morning and, and then you're thinking oh come to the top of mountain mile now i remember coming out of union mills and sitting flat out on the super twin oh god right okay now i've got two miles i'm going to be flat out and i'm doing 150 mile hour calculating how long till i get to roll off the throttle you know it's really hard to focus 
on a slow bike. But the big bike, you're sort of working a lot more and it really draws your attention, you know, to what you're doing at the time. You, you've got to focus. And the, I love that fact that you have to pay attention so much on the big bike. It really does take all of your focus, all of your control all the time. You've had some great results so far over the years. I'm sure there are many more to come, but the number of top 15 finishes, an eighth place finish in the 2018 RL360 Superstock TT. Is that enough for you yet? Have you still got your sights set on something more? Absolutely not enough, no. And um, I've had some results and it sounds a bit bit frustrating for me when you reel them off like that in a way, because you know, that eighth place in the Superstock, that was a fantastic race that was. I had a great race with Ivan Linton and we were battling you know we were overtaking each other every single lap it was really really good he was so much quicker than me over the mountain but I was so much quicker through the bumps and then I went into a great senior race and I was running sixth in the senior that year and then the engine failed on the fifth lap which was quite gutting for me and that's that's part of privateer life you know we can't afford multiple engines and that engine was on its second year that's what happens so I certainly feel like I've shown the potential to run better results than a best of eighth and it's a bit galling for me, you know, that that was, what, six years ago. And in the meantime, we've had COVID, I had a big crash in 2022, and I've not quite found my feet again and put those results in that I know I'm capable of. Let's talk about that instant in 2022, because I think what was most incredible about that was that it was a significant incident, and yet later on in the week, you were back racing. And I don't know how, certainly sort of physically, I think you were still feeling the effects, but again, <laughs> mentally, how you pick yourself up. I mean, I don't even know where you start with that. I think it would be very difficult to walk away after a crash like that. And I was in the situation where my body was recovering just enough to do it again. It's kind of, I'd say it's black and white. It, you know, if you've broken your arms and legs, there's no way you're going to ride again. But if you are physically capable of sitting on the bike, you're certainly going to be looking at always getting out again. And I wasn't able to get on the bike at first just because the swelling was so bad throughout all the, the joints and everything. But as the time went on, I was working with the physios, which are great at the TT. The physio is fantastic there. And we're working on the ice and getting rid of the inflammation. I was able to get on the bike. And then that was it, really. If somebody lent me a spare bike and I could go out again. It was always about getting out again. And what do you remember? about that whole time when it all happened because I guess you kind of almost need to piece it together for yourself and, and try and work out what happened and, and almost put it to rest. It was a rider error. I had a high side which is generally a rider error around here and what's really frustrating for me is it was a complete self-induced thing. I can't blame anything, can't blame the bike. I was trying to get through some slower riders and I'd been stuck with riders that were slower but had faster bikes and I was riding quite well that year. I'd ridden, I'd been a testing i was faster than i'd ever been i was on the new bmw it was a fantastic bike a bsb had had pbs i was scoring points i went to northwest and had a great result so i was really going result to result you know on the bounce i was going better than i'd ever been and i came to the tt we'd all had a big break and it just clicked something just clicked and i felt good but the lap before i crashed i'd caught slow riders and i was just trying to get through and i got so frustrated and i lost my smooth rhythm and when i got through i was so desperate to try and make up time and get in a lap time and you lose that smoothness and before you know it i just snapped on the throttle and it threw me off that was it so real rookie error you know i should have just calmed down got through the traffic and done it but as soon as i got through the traffic i was so desperate to crack on that was it and that really is what tip me over literally <laughs> and that's incredibly honest though isn't it because not wanting to place the blame anywhere else except in actually that was a moment in time where perhaps it was the wrong decision but there's no doubt you learn from that yeah absolutely you know you've got to learn I've got to learn to calm down a bit when getting frustrated on track you know I remember coming down the mountain with these guys and just screaming in my helmet get out of the way and, you know, I was so wound up so wound up you know everything is about the TT for me your whole year is about the TT it's it's not just one event is it your life's work so when people are holding you up you take it very very personally but that's where a bit more time and experience shows me now you know what just don't worry about this lap there's another lap tomorrow you talked about the difficulties of being a privateer and obviously you've got everything that you put in financially certainly we keep coming back to would you ever make the leap to factory i mean how does that all work i would absolutely relish at this point getting on a bike that somebody else is another work because i you know i'm a true privateer i would say and there's less and less of us around now i build the bike in the workshop through winter and i go testing it myself and then i drive the truck i put the awning up and we're a fleet of volunteer mechanics and helpers but essentially it's all sort of my team that i manage and I have certainly reached a point where that is testing me and what I can do in work and on track. It, it's really, you know, reaching the limit of what I can do. And I would love to get the opportunity of riding a bike with someone else has done all that work. And I can just think about riding because at the moment, even now today, you know, I'm going to go back there and set everything up, get through scrutineering. And I've got some guys with me, but I'm going to coordinate everything and then get on the bike at the last minute and ride it. And I'd love to just, you know, turn up and hop on a bike and ride it and just focus on my riding. 
So we're talking about the, the Southern 100. Have you done the Southern before? Yeah, I've done the Southern yep. before, yeah, plenty of years. I didn't do it last year, did it the year before. I've had a good result there, actually. I've had a second in the senior race there, beaten, of course, by Dean Harrison. You know, you're going to struggle to beat Dean around here, aren't you? So I've had some really good results at the Southern, certainly on the big bike, and I've got a great bike this year as well. So it's a tough grid, but I am looking to hopefully get a result this year. And you talk about sort of heading up your own team, and what sort of team boss would you say you are? <laughs> I would say, obviously, that I'm firm but fair. I like to see that everybody has their own qualities and everyone brings something to the team. And I am very fortunate in having these people that come with me and have got their incredible personal strengths. And I think if you put each of these people in the right place in the team, then you can get a fantastic structure. If you try and make people do something they don't want to do, they're never going to do it right, are they? But if you, you get the best out of each person, then you can have a fantastic little team. And there has to be a real friendship there as well. Yeah, there is, you know, and there is a good friendship. We go around the world racing together and it's fantastic. Year after year, you're reunited and you go to these places. We go off to Spain, we're going to Macau, we're coming to the Isle of Man. It's really good and we do all gel very well. I just want to go back to TT this year, which I think was frustrating for a number of reasons. When you sort of did the the debrief yourself, how did you assess TT 2024? Oh, it's a bit of a sigh of relief at the end, actually. I think there was for everyone. You know, it was difficult for a lot of competitors and the organisers. Um, I basically went to race week having not ridden the bikes at all because on Monday I had a little slip off on a wet patch of Governor's Dip, which is embarrassing, very embarrassing. But the older, more experienced guys tell me that everyone has to do that and get that out of the way, so that's done. So I didn't really do anything on Monday. Tuesday was cancelled, wasn't it, with the weather. Wednesday I had a chain come off. We had a stone or something go through the chain from the look of it, so I didn't get any laps on Wednesday. Thursday was cancelled again. So Friday, I got to the last day of the week, having not qualified any of my machines, three bikes to qualify, and I just tried to do the bare minimum of laps on each bike, but the clutch failed on the big bike. I did one lap on the 600, didn't get us on the twin, so that was it. So I really went into race week completely blind with three new bikes as well, not knowing how any of them were going to perform or handle. And there was the issue during race week of a... A pheasant. There was, yeah. So we got our first for the super sport race and, you know, learning the, the bike, it was okay. Felt good. And obviously I qualified really far back. I qualified in 48th place, you know. And coming from having been a seeded rider for a good few years, it's a bit of a shock, you know, <laughs> going that far down the road. There's no PA announcements down there. You don't know what's going on. I overtook three people in the first lap. You know, you're catching the guys very fast at that pace, which brings a new challenge as well. And I just started to get some clear track, and a pheasant come through the front of the bike, coming down to Hillbury. It was on the road, and I thought, don't do it, don't do it. The last minute, it goes, and the thing jumps up, and uh, quite an impact. Oh, I can't even begin to imagine. But, I mean, you were covered in blood as well. I mean, I don't want to be too graphic <laughs> about this, but, I mean, again, it's that how you pull yourself back from that, and that's not an easy thing to hit at that, what, no, I don't know what speed you were going. But. but coming down to Hillbury, you're probably doing about knocking on 160 on the, the super sport bike. And, um, yeah, it was just so frustrating. I just thought, oh, come on, one thing after another, you know. And it was so, the thing just burst on impact, completely burst. And all I can think to describe is, you know, when you're cutting chicken on a chopping board and you get this little stringles and stuff, you know, this little bits. It's like that just everywhere. But it was all because it sort of hit my hand area as well in the front of the bike. It was all in the grip and the glove was just soaked with blood. And I couldn't hold on, so I had to slow down, wave the guy past that I'd overtaken because he couldn't see what was going on. I come into the pits, we cleaned it all off, we forgot everything else, just get fuel and get all the blood off, set off with a slow pit stop, obviously, but then I got black flagged at Ballacrane so the travelling marshals could inspect the bike. I've got to say, it's fantastic from the organisers to black flag you and then allow you to continue. That is really forward thinking, and I, I didn't know you were allowed to do that. That is fantastic, you know, that's really good. But it did completely interrupt my flow. I had a seven minute first sector, and by the time you've done that, the marshals are taking off loose bits of your screen. You set off again, you're not in your race vibe anymore, you've got to snap back into it, which is difficult, and then overtake all the same guys that I'd already overtaken in the first lap. So that really, you know, just took away the, any chance of a result there, which is just so frustrating after the practice week there. I was feeling so down at that point, you know, it was very difficult. But you still finished, what was it, 28th? So I think I can understand from your point of view and being the sort of person that it sounds like you are, that that is really frustrating but what a lesson in perseverance and resilience <laughs> well, thanks i like to see that you can take the positive from it and it is everyone says that wow you know inspiring perseverance oh yeah but it you could have like, given I, up though couldn't you I you could have like, just gone oh well i felt like last place to me you know i was that down and like i say it's your life's work so to come and do something like that when you know where, where it could have been it it's just so demoralising, so frustrating. But you go, well, that's that one done, so we'll do another one tomorrow, and that, that's all you can do, isn't it? And that is the beauty of this new schedule that some people complain about it. There's, there's positives and negatives, but there's a lot of races, so you can put one behind you and crack on with the next one. 
Just think how Mrs Pheasant was feeling at home. Um, <laughs> so we are then at the start of Southern 100. Hopefully, we're looking out the window at the moment. The weather is glorious today. We have everything crossed. Just talk us through what your week is going to look like, you know, from the behind the scenes. It's so great seeing you out there on the course, but what is it like the rest of the time? What are you up to? You know what? The Southern is a bit of a holiday race. and <laughs> I possibly shouldn't say that, but for some reason, the microclimate weather down there is great. It's beautiful weather up here even in Douglas today it always seems to be sunny at the Southern 100 I don't know what it is maybe we just forget the rain so we go out as a team in the morning we went out on the motorbikes yesterday just pootling around the little lanes we go out swimming in the morning go for a walk get up around Brad ahead you know it's so nice around these bits of the island and there's enough time at the Southern to do this stuff and get back to the circuit all in time the TT is so busy and so focused there's a lot less time for that sort of stuff and the same with the classic the, the Manx um, but the Southern gives us an opportunity to explore the island do some tourist stuff and really have a holiday and then we get to go racing in the evenings as well which is bloody fantastic get an ice cream and peel yesterday did you? three ice creams yesterday three ice creams three, yeah. three ice creams at three different locations it was good yeah, the is best that the one racers was diet the, the is the it? yeah well uh, I'm bulking you see, oh, so see. that's it I'm right. trying to pack on the calories ready so I can burn them off this evening um, looking ahead at uh, not many more weeks away now we have got Manx Grand Prix and uh, all set for that this year too yeah and I'm really looking forward to it this year we've got a fantastic Ducati I can't announce much about the team at the moment but I can say that I am going to be on Ducati and for me Ducati racing was where I started that's how I got into racing in the first place a Ducati Championship it was a Ducati dealership that took me into British Superbikes so for me that really feels like coming home and I can't wait to ride that beautiful Ducati So looking back over your career again so far because you are only 36 that's still young in, in racers terms um, Thank you Looking back is there anything you think you would have done differently up to this point? I think we made so many mistakes with naivety, certainly in the first five years, I'd say ten years of my career, you know, not coming from a racing family and not knowing these things. I remember somebody took me to BSB and said, you need to get, said to me and my dad, you need to get this lad in BSB. And we went round to the teams to look at buying a ride. And obviously it cost a fortune to pay for a ride. We just sort of laughed our way out of there and went, well, that's never going to happen. And in hindsight now, if I'd somehow managed to find that money, then... I could have been bought on by someone's experience much faster but we laughed off the experience and went well we're not paying that sort of money and that really put me on the back foot for many years it is what led me into being a privateer I suppose where I do my own thing and that's good I enjoy that with the way I work and my workshop as well but I, you know I missed out on so many people's experience just through the naivety you know, my ignorance of youth So I guess that would be a piece of advice for anybody else thinking about getting into this Yeah absolutely if you're showing some signs of actually being able to ride a bike don't shun other people's experience I'm not saying that I didn't listen to people you know or ignored their advice but certainly doing it my own way meant I was very slow to learn and I picked things up and I made mistakes myself whereas I could have just had someone you know showing me the ropes that would have been a lot better and in terms of getting sponsorship in terms of maybe thinking about getting a ride in the next few years one of the things you have to do I suppose is make sure that you are up to date with your social media presence and so people can follow you how do you find that side of things i'm really really bad at social media <laughs> um i'm really bad at it because i never had to do it before and i was never really into it so i really do it for the racing and i've got quite into it you know with instagram and facebook but there's so many platforms you know it's so difficult if you're going to go well i'm going to do the instagram and the facebook and i'm going to do the twitter x thing and then there's the new one threads and you go well it's almost a full-time job just to do your social media management so I do what I can with it and I'm surprised actually how many people follow my stuff it's amazing you think why do these people want to see everything but you know it's really nice and especially with having such a difficult TT the amount of support I had was just unbelievable I couldn't believe all these people coming to the awning saying we're watching everything you're doing online Sam keep the updates going and that really, really helped in such a difficult week to know that I wasn't out there on my own, that people were aware, you know, of what was going on and were supporting me. It's fantastic to get that level of support. And where is the best place for people then to keep up to date with what you're doing? Oh, that's difficult to say. I suppose the best thing is probably the good old traditional Instagram, Facebook platform, because Facebook is the best for putting a big long post to try and explain something, isn't it? And Instagram's the best for quick pictures, stories, see what we're up to around the paddock. Wonderful. You sound like a social media king there. So we'll put the uh, the links to your Instagram and Facebook on the podcast page. We just wish you all the very best for Southern 100 Week. Can't wait to see you back at MGP as well and offer another ice cream or two today before Thanks the race. Thanks very racing. much. I think it'd be rude not to, wouldn't it? Sam, thank you so much. Thank you.